Good morning, everybody. Guys, good to be with you again this morning, and I uh, really trust that you've had an uh, awesome, awesome Passover weekend. Uh, it's been really just great to be able to celebrate, first and foremost, the, um, uh, you know, and, and just remember the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, the incredible impact that it has had on our lives. And uh, so, we thank the Lord that that is not the only thing that we're going to be celebrating this weekend, but that we're also going to be celebrating, you know, this morning, His resurrection. So, um, before I continue, um, it's great to have uh, Pastor Anna with me this morning as well. 
So we're going to be doing this together as much as we can. So um, you know, this is uh, this is going to be interesting, but really looking forward to uh, spending time in the Word and you know, rejoicing in the day of resurrection. And uh, remember what I said: uh, if you guys can just make sure that you have your communion uh, communion elements available or close by, uh, because towards the end of this morning service, we're going to be taking communion. So it'll be good to have you breaking bread with your family and with your children and etc. But uh, before I continue, I'm going to ask Pastor Anna to open up for us in prayer as she commits this morning's service to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Please, Pastor Anna, thank you. Amen. Well, thank you, Father, that as we come before you, we just come with humble hearts, Lord God. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we are glad. And Lord, we come with tears of joy because you love us. And so thank you. That as we go into this into the word now, and Father, as you said that we would sup thereof, we thank you, Holy Spirit of God, that you are here, that you are present with us and you're present with our loved ones, and you're present with all those who will hear our voice this morning. So thank you for this day, and thank you, Father, that we are yours and that you love us with an everlasting love. So we de- dedicate this morning to you. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, guys, uh, as I said to you guys uh, on, on Friday when we uh, looked at the, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and uh, the significance of it and uh, the importance, uh, especially in relation to our lives, um, you know, I want to continue along those lines throughout the course of this morning. Now, as I said on Friday, which I want to emphasize again this morning, is that really for us that are followers of Christ, um, this weekend uh, is not some religious event. For us, this weekend is not some religious ritual that we participate in. For us, uh, it has significant meaning. Uh, and really, in truth and reality, this, this weekend has significant meaning for all of mankind. So the objective of my presentation this, uh, uh, throughout this weekend and throughout this morning again, is to go back to the Scripture and to look at what, how does the Scripture reveal to us the significance of what we are celebrating over the course of this weekend? How has this really changed uh, the course of, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of events as far as mankind is concerned, as far as God's creation is concerned? And what are the eternal impacts of, this, uh, of what we are celebrating over this weekend? Now, you know, I think one of the things that is always so important is that you know, when we think about this weekend, uh, we, we need to go back first and foremost to the scripture. But, you know, one of the things that we need to remember this morning is that, you know, what we experience and celebrate of this weekend is, is something that God uh, uh, reveals to us from the very, very beginning, uh, in, uh, as recorded in the book of Genesis. And uh, so I, I want to start this morning by reading a, a, a scripture that I'm sure most of us are familiar with. Uh, and spend a bit of time in that as we uh, set the context um, for some of the points that I want to communicate with all of you this morning. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, now you'll remember, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible gives us the account of how the fall of man took place and uh, how sin entered into uh, this perfect creation that God had created originally without any sin, without any sickness, without any disease, without any suffering. Everything we uh, learn from the Bible, from the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1, reveals to us that what God created, He created in absolute perfection. Uh, and, and, you know, nothing less than His own nature and character. As you and I are aware, God is perfect. God is holy. God is sinless. You know, God is love. He is all of these things. So whatever God has created and whatever God created in Genesis chapter 1, really in many respects was an extension of His very nature and character. So sin was never part of the original plan. Uh, why? Because it's not part of God. So we, we see in Genesis chapter 3 that the reason why we have sin in creation and the reason why we celebrate this weekend is because of ultimately uh, of what Adam and Eve and, and, uh, had done in the Garden of Eden and that through their actions, uh, the entire human race, including creation, was deeply affected through the introduction of sin and rebellion into the affairs of this perfect creation. Now, so, you know, what is interesting here is that, you know, after Adam and Eve had sinned and rebelled against God, we see that the Bible reveals to us, 
you know, that God called out to them in the Garden of Eden. And after they had, uh, after he had found them and after he had begun to respond to them as a result of their sin, uh, we see that, that instead of God responding in anger and in judgment, God responds with a promise. And this Genesis chapter 3.15 is the first what we refer to as messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. In, set, in fact, sets the entire context for the Bible uh, that we have today, the scriptures. This scripture really sets the context of all scriptures. So here in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, God's response to Adam and Eve is as follows. Uh, and it needs to be understood in the context of a promise that God makes. And a promise that God makes not just to Adam and Eve, but the God, a promise that God makes to all of, of mankind. And here he says to Adam and Eve, and obviously he is addressing Adam, he is addressing Eve, and he is also addressing the serpent, who is uh, Satan uh, in this portion of Scripture. He, this is what he says. And I will put enmity between thee, speaking about the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So when you look at the scripture very clearly, there are two aspects to the scripture that are very, very important in regards to the promise that God would make. The promise that God would make that the descendant of the woman, which is referring to the Messiah, that he would uh, uh, bruise a Satan's head or the serpent's head, but that the serpent, uh, in the process of that, would bruise his heel. Now the bruising of the heel, yeah, again, because of time, you know, I don't have time to go into too much deep explanation to try and highlight this, but what we need to understand from this prophecy is that this prophecy highlights to us that the Messiah, the seed of the woman, would experience two things. On the one hand, the, 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 the seed of the woman would experience a bruising of the heel by way of the serpent, but, in, but, but the outcome of this is that the seed of the woman would crush or bruise the, uh, the, the, the head of the serpent. And, and really, this reveals to us two things, uh, which points very clearly, number one, to the crucifixion and the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and also uh, to his resurrection. So in the crucifixion, his, bru his heel is being bruised, as prophesied from the very beginning here, that this is what would happen, and this is what would be required, but at the same time reveals to us very clearly that in, the, in the, 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 the process or the cause and effect of his heel being bruised, that, uh, that the Messiah would, uh, that in turn, would crush serpents, the serpent's head or strip him of his complete authority. And so, so, so what we learn from this portion of Scripture is that really you, we, we cannot just relate to the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ but that this weekend represents to us also the importance of the resurrection. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, the point that I want to make on this first point as I get into some of the implications of the resurrection as far as the cross is concerned and as far as our lives are concerned is the following. We must understand this morning that if Christ never rose up from the dead, then everything that Jesus would have done through his suffering and and through the crucifixion, would really have been done in futility. In other words, everything would have, would have been, in essence, a waste of time. Its impact would not have been what God intended it to be. So therefore, we need to understand that the resurrection of Christ is as important as the crucifixion of Christ. And therefore, in this weekend, as Christians, we do not just identify with his crucifixion, but we need to identify with his resurrection. And therefore, uh, Scripture makes it very clear that this resurrection was literal and that it was not symbolic and it was not figurative. In other words, three days later, Jesus rose up from the dead as Scripture has clearly pointed out that he would do prophetically from the Old Testament, starting here from Genesis 3.15, and also by Jesus' own account as he walked with his disciples and promised that he would do. So the point, the first point that I want to make this morning as we celebrate this day is that we need to identify with the resurrection of Christ and because of the resurrection of Christ, my friends, that whatever Christ had suffered and whatever Christ had done on the cross was fulfilled in its entirety because of that, uh, 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 that, that, uh, that resurrection. Amen? 
So, you know, before I continue, you know, Pastor Anna, what are your thoughts on that? You know, is there anything that you would like to contribute in as far as that resurrection is concerned or the impact of that resurrection? Uh, amen? Anything you want to say? <laughs> carry on. Oh, I says I can carry on. Okay, so I'm in good grounds here on safe grounds. Amen. All right, so guys, let us get into it this morning. Now, remember what I said on Friday. The primary objective of the cross was to communicate the following truth. Now, remember... That, that God is love, but God is just. And both of what Christ had done on the cross was an expression of the love of God, number one, in love, but number two, was a fulfillment in relation to God's wrath as directed to sin. So I want to read a, a paragraph here that, that really communicates what took place on the cross. Now, in justice, God had condemned humanity and demanded complete satisfaction for our crimes against Him. However, in love, God took humanity upon Himself. He became one of us. That is Jesus. Amen? And bore our sins and suffered the penalty we deserve. And He died in our place. And this is what we refer to as the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel means, the good news. However, what we again need to identify with here is that in the statement, we are identifying with the suffering, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we know that from Scripture, the Bible reveals to us very clearly that in order for Jesus to be the true Messiah, number one, he would have to uh, be born, he would have to live, and he would have to die according to Old Testament requirements and old te of the law and Old Testament requirements uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, as, as, as prophesied in regards to prophecy. And we know that he did that. And as I said already here, when we look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he fulfilled through his death, on the cross, through his suffering as pertaining to the cross, he fulfilled the first part of that prophecy in relation uh, to his sufferings and death, etc., as I've communicated, and, and as prophesied throughout the Old Testament, and as prophesied in regard to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. However, there is another part of this prophecy that had to be fulfilled, and that had to be associated with his resurrection where he literally stripped Satan of his authority, literally crushed Satan's head, and rendered him without power and influence. In other words, what I am trying to say is this, is that through Christ's crucifixion, he became our substitute. He took our place. But my friends, through his, through his resurrection, he exercised his sovereign authority over sin and death and everything associated with it. And it can be rightly said that because of his resurrection, that whatever Christ performed on the cross became a reality in relation to all of humanity and creation. In other words, Christ did not just shed his blood that our sins be washed away. No, no, no. He also rose up from the dead that through his authority and resurrection, he would restore all things to its former glory as God had anticipated from the very beginning. And this, therefore, it can be rightly said, and it, and, and it can be rightly communicated, that you cannot ex uh, only uh, receive uh, just what was done on the cross. You need to receive also the truth and the reality of His resurrection. Amen. Because these two together is ultimately what communicates the essence of the gospel. On the one hand, Christ our propitiation. On the other hand, uh, Christ our reconciler and restorer. And, and, and ultimately fulfilling the primary agenda. And what was the primary agenda? The primary agenda through the promise that God made to Adam and Eve was not only to bring them back into right relationship with Him, but the primary agenda was to restore all things to its former glory before sin came into man's affairs and creation affairs as a result of the, uh, uh, the rebellion of Adam and Eve. Now, this concept, my friends and brothers and sisters, is, is communicated exactly through what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14. If, it, uh, uh, if Christ 
is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. In other words, if Christ did not rise up from the dead, if Christ did not literally rise up, then everything we believe as Christians in regards to restoration, reconciliation, salvation, and redemption is baseless. It is unfounded. No power. Why can we rejoice? Why can we know that the gospel we preach has power? The reason why we can do that is because Christ rose up from the dead. Amen. So Christ's statement on the cross when he said it was finished would have been pointless. It would have been empty if he never rose up from the dead three days later. So brothers and sisters, as we get into uh, uh, this, this reality, first of all, from a historical fact, as I said, we, again, because of the constraints of time in the service this morning, there is overwhelming information that is evident from an historical perspective regarding the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is a historical fact. His resurrection, for example, was witnessed by 500 different individuals at the time of his resurrection. Amen? And many evidences uh, that point to that since then that can be historically bad. But we want to look at the spiritual. We want to look at uh, the, 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 the biblical, scriptural implications of the resurrection uh, as far as we are concerned. So what does the resurrection communicate to us this morning? Number one, John chapter 2, verse 18 through to 19. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And what sign were they looking for? They, they, were, they were looking for a sign that would associate it with his claim that number one, that he was the Son of God. Because in claiming that he was the Son of God, he was, he was claiming equality with God. Remember, after this, he says, listen to me, I will show you a sign. And the sign will prove to you that I am the Son of God, that I am God. I will destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Now, obviously, when Jesus said that, they automatically thought that he was referring to the literal temple itself. We know that he was not referring to that, and Scripture makes it very clear that he was not referring to that. Romans chapter 1, verse 4, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness and by the resurrection from the dead. Three days later, my friends, brothers and sisters, Jesus rose from the dead. The temple that he was talking about was his own body. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. We know that God could do that. I mean, he created the heavens and the earth in six days. There weren't six billion years. No, there were six literal days. If God can create the universe, God can do anything. Well, exactly. That's the point. The reason why he rose up from the dead is because he could. The reason why he rose up from the dead is because he is God. The reason why he rose up from the dead is because he is the Son of God. So when we celebrate resurrection today, brothers and sisters, we are celebrating it. Because in the resurrection and through the resurrection, Christ has demonstrated, number one, that he is the Son of God. Number two, that he is God and that it is truly finished. And for you and I and for all of mankind, the good news is this, brothers and sisters, who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But not only saved, that we can look forward to a day that when we all will experience physical death in our lives, we all know that that will not be the end of the story. Because the end of the story for all of us has already been prophesied 2,000 years ago through His resurrection. That those who believe in Him shall not be disappointed, but will be resurrected in Him as well. Amen. Amen. Secondly, uh, uh, um, the second point that I want to communicate about the significance of His resurrection is that the resurrection is proof that God accepted Christ's death as fulfillment of payment of our sin. Now, that is imperative. That, it, that is so important to understand. I made references to this on Friday when I said, you know, that if Jesus in any way had committed sin in his lifetime as a child, uh, as growing back as a teenager, as walking around in those 30 years prior to his three years of ministry, he would have been disqualified. The very fact when Jesus walked down to those baptismal waters 
And uh, before John baptized him, and as John was baptizing, and the Spirit of God came down, and the voice of the Father in it, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased, communicated clearly the sinlessness of Christ, His perfection, that He had fulfilled the first part of His requirement, and that was to be found without spot or blemish or sin, which was a clear um, uh, uh, requirement for Him to be the Messiah, as demonstrated and practiced throughout the entire Old Testament in relation to sacrifices. My friends, you now need to remember this, that, that if Christ had sin in His life, He could not have been that sinless sacrifice. He could not have been at that perfect sacrifice. So we automatically know that at His baptism, my friend, he was without sin. However, it is in His resurrection that we are clearly, uh, uh, that this message uh, is clearly communicated that even in His three years of walking with His discipleships and deliberating with mankind in His regards to His ministry, the fact that He rose up from the dead tells us that He had paid the, uh, the, paid the payment as far as sin was concerned in full. Romans chapter 4 verse 25, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up because of our justification. Now remember, you cannot understand this scripture unless you understand it in relation to God and relation in relation to the justice and the holiness of God. God's justice and His holiness demanded that whoever who would be that substitute that, that the only way that the, the only way the substitution could be accepted as being paid in full in relation to the offenses as a result of our sins would, could only be done if that individual had fulfilled all requirements pertaining to the law and pertaining to the sacrificial requirements as put out and as spelled out in the Old Testament. So that's why I said it from the beginning and I want to say it again here this morning. You and I must understand that Christ the Messiah, Christ the Messiah did not only fulfill the Old Testament requirements in regards to the prophets as pertaining to the sacrificial requirements. No, he also fulfilled all requirements in regards to the demands of the law. And remember, the wages of sin is death. And, and, and if he had any sin in his life, there would be no, no, he could not have been resurrected from the dead. He would have been disqualified. The very fact that he rose up from the dead is exactly what Paul is communicating to us in Romans chapter 4, is in the essence of what's been communicating to us throughout the gospel and throughout the epistles through the New Testament, that he was the perfect sacrifice. And because he was the perfect sacrifice, he appeased the wrath of God that is directed against all sin. In other words, paid in full. And because of that payment, he was resurrected from the dead. God raised Jesus Christ because his death had satisfied and secured the believer's pardon and was able to bring us into right standing with God. Why? Through the justification that we have received through the blood of Jesus Christ. And again, that's why I'm saying to you, if you cannot just believe in the resurrection and not believe that, uh, sorry, in the, in the crucifixion and not believe that the resurrection was literal. The resurrection is testament. Resurrection uh, declares that what Christ did on the cross was enough, was finished, was complete once and for all. So that's why when we look at uh, 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 the, the next point is that the resurrection is proof of the believer's future resurrection, as I made, made that I alluded to in the previous point. Because Christ rose up from the dead, because of his perfect substitution, before, because of his perfect sacrifice, because of that resurrection, because that through that resurrection, he had appeased the wrath of God directed against all sin. And then when you and I come into right relationship with God in Christ, we, are the one, we no longer live. We no longer uh, live in regards to our former lives. No, we are, uh, our identity is in Christ's identity. Therefore, you know, Paul made a references to this in Galatians where he would say, for it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news. 
because of the resurrection 2,000 years ago, three days after the crucifixion. You and I, you and I are assured of resurrection uh, at the appearance of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when Christ returns, what will happen? Let's read 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14. And God both has both raised up the Lord and will also raise up, 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 us up by His power. Through the power of His resurrection, through the power of God, you and I will experience physical resurrection. In fact, if you read the Scriptures correctly and study the Scriptures correctly, all of us who are followers of Christ have already experienced some measure of resurrection. And that resurrection being on a spiritual level. That when we become believers and followers of Christ, uh, Jesus referred to it as being born again spiritually. So this morning, we, 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 we not only look forward to physical resurrection, no, my friends. Amen. We rejoice that we have been brought into right relationship with God. In other words, we are alive. And therefore, we need to understand the resurrection highlights very clearly that true Christianity is not a religion because religion cannot re cannot resurrect you from the dead re 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 religion and good works and feeding the poor and all of these things that may be commendable cannot save you from the power of sin the only thing that can save you and redeem you from the power of sin is the lord jesus christ himself his blood not only covers our sins his blood washes our sins away it is more powerful than the blood of, uh, of goats and bulls, as we see in regards to the pattern of the Old Testament. Now, my friends, as I come to the end of my sermon and hand over to Pastor Emma to do communion this morning, and then directly after communion, what I will do is I will conclude by, you know, just briefly sharing what Christ has accomplished through His death and resurrection. But one more point that I want to, uh, uh, that I want to communicate regarding His resurrection the following. The resurrection is proof that the world has a Lord and a judge. My friend, the resurrection reveals to us that every human being will stand before God. The first time Jesus came, we know that the Bible reveals to us, the scriptures reveal that the Messiah will come on two occasions. The first time he came, he came 2,000 years ago. He came as a lamb. And the objective to be a lamb was to suffer and die and to be our substitute so that you and I could be saved and be brought into right relationship with God. But I need to warn everybody here this morning. When Jesus returns a second time, he will not return as a lamb. He will return as judge. In fact, the symbol associated with Christ in his second coming is the symbol of a lion. And when Jesus returned, every human being, both great and and small, both young and old, irrespective of who you are, from Adam all the way to the last human being that was ever created, will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and will have to give an account of their lives. Let me read the following three scriptures. Acts chapter 2 verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ, both Lord and Savior. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, amen, and given him a name which is above every name, hallelujah, amen. that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. Acts 17, verse 30 to 31. Truly, these times of ignorance God has overlooked, referring to the Old Testament, referring to the time between uh, 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 leading up to His second coming and or, or up to the, uh, His first coming. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Brothers and sisters, through the revelation of Christ's first coming, through His death and resurrection, after that, God commands that all men should and must come to repentance. In other words, God is giving mankind an opportunity to escape the judgment that is coming. That's what the scripture is referring to. Amen? And uh, notice what it says in verse 10 again, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those of, on the earth and those that are under the earth, referring to hell. Acts 17, verse 32, 31. Truly, in these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. 
because he has appointed a day, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained, that Jesus Christ. He has given the assurance of, uh, of his, this to all by raising him from the dead. So brothers and sisters, in conclusion this morning, as I hand over to Pastor Anna, as she leads us into a time of communion, I want to speak to everybody here today. Everybody here today. If you have responded to Christ, if you have acknowledged Him as Savior and Lord, rejoice. Rejoice. Why? Because He rose up from the dead. And because of that resurrection, we will not die. Although our physical bodies will perish, we will not die. We will go from glory to glory to glory. And therefore, I rejoice. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on in the world in which we are living right now, we know that these things are coming. But for the follower of Christ, my friends, we rejoice because we have been resurrected from the dead. And one day we will be restored spiritually, soulishly, and physically at his second appearing. Amen. So I want to, but for, for, for the rest of us, if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, I, you know, I share this, this message. You need to make your life right with Jesus. You need to come into right relationship with the Lord, and I'll give you an opportunity at the end of this, uh, this meeting uh, to do that. But let's hand over to Pastor Anna as she takes us through to communion. Over to you, Pastor Anna. Amen. 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 Well, I want to keep going. Mm. I'm sure you've all um, listened and heard well. Um, so, yes, um, as we start partaking of the communion elements this morning, um, it's quite amazing that in partaking of this communion, us as believers in Christ Yeshua, we, 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 we celebrate this time. We celebrate, and, and why? Because it's a table of remembrance. Um, in fact, Jesus said that, and we're going to read that just now. And um, what, is it, uh, uh, what is it for? Well, it's a remembrance of the fact that he paid with his own blood. He paid with his body um, the price um, for our sin that we may be cleansed. So in partaking of these elements, it, they are symbolic. Not only is the bread symbolic of his broken body and the, the fact that it was broken and beaten for us, but the fact that also the wine is symbolic of his blood that flowed. And so when we partake, we recognize the fact that we are remembering the price he paid for our sin on that cross. And so we are going to look at this. Um, in just a, 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 a reading the scripture, because that is obviously my, my, my point this morning. It's not our opinion, but it's what the scripture is saying. The Lord's table is set, so it's a table of cleansing, as I said. It is also, in, in, in doing this this morning, it's not the, the, the partaking of the elements that are going to save us, because only the receiving um, the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price and receiving him as our Lord and Savior, that is what saves us. However, it is an act of worship, an act of remembrance, and an act of obedience to Christ. Why? Because he commanded us so. So we're going to have a look. Now in 1 Corinthians 11, um, from verse 23, it says, I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you. It was given to me personally. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was treacherously delivered up, and while his betrayal was in progress, he took bread. So we see this as a picture of that Last Supper that we've so often seen, whether it's in picture form. Many people that don't know Christ have seen the picture of the Last Supper. But yeah, we see in the scripture that this is what was happening amongst him and the disciples. His betrayal was in progress at the time. And when he had given thanks, he broke the spring and he said, take it, it is my body which is broken for you and do this in remembrance. Affectionately, my Bible says in the Amplified, affectionately into, in remembrance of me. And so we see here that it's a command. He's saying, do this, take it and do it. And then we see um, in verse 25, similarly when supper was ended, and that was a scripture that I'd never noticed before. And, you know, we will skip read over so many things. It said when it was ended, so they ate, they took the bread, they ate of that. And when the, the supper was ended, he, he took the cup, also saying, this cup is the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. In other words, the seal of approval by the blood of Christ. 
Do this as often as you drink it to, uh, uh, to call me affectionately. In other words, to remember. He says to call me to remembrance as well. We are calling the fact, or, uh, we're calling Jesus Christ um, to remembrance of the price he paid for my sin and yours. And it says in verse 26, which is of utmost importance, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death till he comes again. So not only are we re uh, uh, representing Christ, not only are we signifying, but we are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes again. And then in verse 27 it says, So when whoever eats the bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy, in an unworthy manner, he is guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and the blood of Christ. So, in other words, you have to be in right standing with God. You have to be in right standing by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, when you partake of these elements, you're going to make a mockery of it. It's not going to have any true meaning to you. You need to take it and be worthy of that, of, of, of representing Christ. It says, so in other words, before you take it, let a man thoroughly examine himself. And only when he has done so, should he then eat of the bread and drink of this cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that it is Christ's body and um, eats and drinks a sentence of verdict of judgment upon himself. And I just want to confirm the scriptures as in Luke uh, uh, 22 verse 19 when he took a loaf of bread and then he had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, again, in verse 20 of Luke 22, it says, And he took the cup of the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament, or the New Covenant, ratified in my blood, which is shed and poured out for you. Wow, he was, he was actually speaking about what was going to take place. And um, we see again, just to confirm one last scripture, and that is in Luke 20, uh, 24. 24. Let's read from verse 30. It says, And it occurred that he reclined at the table with them. He reclined. He just went over with his amazing uh, compassion. And he took the loaf of bread and praised God and gave thanks and asked a blessing and then took it and broke it and gave it to them. And when their eyes were instantly opened and they clearly recognized him. And then we see here in this scripture, he vanished. Now we know that that was done after the resurrection. So we are going back to this time where we are saying he took the bread and he broke it. And this morning we are going to partake of these elements. We're going to take this bread. We're going to be obedient to the command that Jesus Christ Yeshua gave that day when he did his lost supper with his disciples. But we cry and we, 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 we celebrate um, not only in gratitude and thankfulness that he paid the price for our sin, but we celebrate in awe and we are excited at the same time because we know that it is because of the blood of Christ that one day we will see him face to face. So let's partake together, brothers and sisters, of this amazing symbolic um, act of love that Jesus Christ showed on the cross. And as we partake, don't forget to pass the key. Um, we don't have to, to put it into our little cups. It, we've already done it this morning. And so we are going to partake. But first of all, I'm going to break this bread. I'm going to break this bread that was made specially for us to eat thereof. And we are going to partake as we break it. It says break the bread, not cut it. So this morning we are going to break of it. We're going to break this bread and we're going to partake of this meal. Amen. He broke Amen. the body of Christ that was, that was broken for us. And this morning we thank the Lord for this bread. Thank yes. you, Father, that as we partake of this meal, of this supper this morning, we thank you that your body was broken, beaten, Father God, to an unrecognizable way. Father God, but today, it, it, this morning, as we partake of this bread, we thank you that it is life.
to our body, that it is strength for us. And as we partake, we remember you, God. And we thank you, Father God, that as we partake of this bread, that it gives us life. And Father, that it restores us. And that, Father, we don't have to go through that teaching because you have done it for us. So we thank you, God, that as we eat and sup thereof, that we eat as unto you this morning. Thank because you, we remember you in Jesus' name. Thank Father. you, Jesus. Thank you. And Father, this morning, as we take this cup, symbolic of you of the of, of, of your your blood that flowed in Romans two, it says that in Romans five verse two, sorry, it says that the blood still speaks today. It speaks of justification, just as if I had never sinned. So we partake this morning of this blood because it is the blood that has resurrection power. Yes. It is the blood that speaks of life. The blood that flows through us, Father God, the blood of your Son, Jesus, that, Father, we are heirs of the Father, joint heirs with Christ. Yes. And this morning, as we partake of this element, we remember you. And we remember the price you paid. And as that blood flowed for us, we thank you that it cleanses us of all unrighteousness and that we are have right standing with you, Yahweh yes. Elohim. Because of the precious blood that flowed that day. We partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we want to just thank you this morning in Jesus' name for the favor that you have extended to us. Mm -hmm. Through your only begotten Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I know it would take an eternity for us to appreciate and to comprehend that which was done for us. Yes. Lord, for all of us know that what we have received, we have not received because we deserve it, That's right. but because you have loved us. We want to thank you. Lord, we want to honor you this morning for all of that which you have done and for which you have you still do for us. Because we know that you make it into every intercession for us continually. I pray that in your name that we may be found faithful before you. That we may present you in a manner that is worthy of your name. Mm -hmm. Worthy of the Father. Yes. We pray this in your mighty name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, I want to conclude by emphasizing one important fact about this weekend. That Passover should always remind us of what Christ has accomplished. Everything we have had this honor and privilege to receive should always be reminded from this perspective, or remembered from this perspective, that we really did not deserve it. It communicates to us the love of God. It communicates to us the mercy of God. But it also communicates to us the power of God. And the power of God has been made manifest to us, to which Christ has accomplished. Scripture says, for I can do all things through Christ Jesus. For if any man be in Christ, behold, all things have passed over, behold, all things have become new because he is a new creature in Christ. As we move forward as believers and as followers of Christ, we need to pursue an identity in that which Christ has accomplished. And I want to read a couple of scriptures in closing before I give an opportunity for people come into right relationship with God this morning. In John chapter 19, verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The scripture reveals to us that what Christ has accomplished 
has what he, uh, that he has what he has accomplished is finished. In other words, no more sacrifice. Nothing else has to ever be done in the future to ensure that what took place in the Garden of Eden will ever happen again, because it will not. Everything has been fulfilled. It is done. What we look forward to, my friends, is to his appearing. That through that appearing, you and I would come into intimate, tangible relationship with the Lord forever and ever. Secondly, Romans 3.26, to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus not only fulfilled all the requirements of the law, amen, he is also the one who brings us into right relationship with God because he is justified and is justified. Amen? Mm -hmm. Psalm 65, 85 verse 10. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace at fist. In other words, we have been the righteous requirements of the law were fulfilled in Christ, so that in Christ we may be brought into peace with God. God's wrath that was directed against us as sinners, that the price associated, the punishment associated, has been paid in full. Christ accomplished that. Romans chapter 5 was 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, that do not walk according to the flesh, but a walk in accordance to the Spirit. My friends, let me be remind everybody this morning. For us that have truly been saved and brought into right relationship with the Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can rejoice in one fact, yeah. that we not only have been delivered from the power of sin, not Amen. only that, no, we've also mm -hmm. received the power of God, the grace of God, that we may live free of sin. Thank you, and because Lord. of that, you, there is no longer any condemnation to Amen. us. Amen? You, John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. My friend, whoever you are, I ask you one important question. Are you in right relationship with God? There is no religion, there is no good work that you could ever engage in that can ever bring you into right relationship with God. Even if you think you are a good person, God's laws reveal to you that that is not the truth. Every human being has fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned, and therefore all of us are in need of a Savior. And Jesus said, and he made it clear, that no man can come into right relationship with God unless it be through him. My question to you this morning is this. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you acknowledged your sin? Have you and are you willing to repent from your rebellion and from your sinfulness and from, the, uh, and from being a sinner? And, and, and are you willing to acknowledge Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, as your Savior and Lord this morning? Acts, 14, verse, uh, Acts 4 verse 12. Nor, there, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we can be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator between God and them, the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in conclusion to this service this morning, in order, I want to extend an invitation to anyone out there that may be listening to me. And I think the scripture and the presentation through the service and through the sermon and through communion has communicated one thing clearly. That the only way you and I could ever come into right relationship with God is through God's provision, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Three things that you Amen. need to do this morning in order to come into right relationship with God. Number one, you need to acknowledge that you are a sinner mm -hmm. and that you have fallen short of God's righteous requirements. Yeah. Amen? Number two, you need to acknowledge 
that Jesus Christ and He and He alone is the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sins of the world who is able to save you and through His blood bring you into right relationship with God. And number three, you need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ, from this day on forward, that you give Him your life, everything, and that from this day on forward, you will live for Him. You will live for the Father. You will, be, you, 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 you will give your entire life that He may be the Lord of your life moving forward. If you're willing to do those three things this morning, then I want to lead you in a short prayer, and I ask you to pray this prayer out aloud. Pray it from the bottom of your heart, and pray by faith. Amen. Let us bow our heads as we pray. God, I stand before you this morning, and I acknowledge you that, that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are my creator. And Lord, I know that I have been living in rebellion towards you. I've been doing my own thing. In so many areas of my life, I have been indifferent, indifferent towards you. Not caring what you think about what I think. Not caring about what you think about what I do. And yet, Lord, when I look into your perfect law, the Ten Commandments, I am guilty as charged according to your word and according to your laws. So therefore, today, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And therefore, in your presence and in front of all those that witness, I this day choose to repent and turn away from my life of rebellion against you. But Lord, I acknowledge this morning also in relation to this, that without a Savior, I cannot come into right relationship with you. So through repentance this morning, I also acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. I acknowledge you, Jesus, the Son of God. I acknowledge you, Jesus, the Savior of all men. I acknowledge you, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And I acknowledge that not only did you die, but that you rose up from the grave after three days. Yes. So today, Jesus, I invite you and ask you to come into my life, to come and to take full control and to become my Lord and Savior. For from this day onwards, I acknowledge Christ as my Savior, but I also acknowledge you, my Lord, as my Lord. You said, if any man desire to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Yeah. Well, today I declare, whatever it is and wherever it is that you lead, yes, I will put my life into your hands. Yeah. I will trust you, yes. and therefore I declare this morning that Christ is my Lord. Yes. And therefore, Lord, this morning by faith, I pray, I receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of promise that you have promised to all of those who will receive your new life. And by faith I receive that. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will come into my heart, into my life, and that I would be the temple of your Spirit. And that from this day on forward, I will live for the glory of your name. Today I give you praise, Father, for the gift that I have received in Jesus. And I acknowledge you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So if you prayed that this morning, make sure uh, you carry on listening to us. You need to get into the Word of God, the Bible. Find a good church if you're nowhere close to us. Um, get a hold of us. I think all of our details do appear on the, the video screens. And um, just, you know, uh, uh, communicate with us so we can give you direction and good counsel. But if I could encourage you to do anything, whatever you do doing from this day on forward, follow Jesus. Brothers and sisters, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Rejoice in this day. Amen. Let us celebrate in the resurrection. Yes. And in the midst of whatever is ahead of us, I want to remind you, it is not over. Okay, mm -hmm. why? Jesus has not returned yet. And if he has not returned yet, it's because the trumpet hasn't sounded. And because the trumpet hasn't sounded, means that the mission has not yet been accomplished. So no matter what lays ahead of us, God is not finished. Amen. Amen. So we carry on. Amen. In yeah. Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Anna.
Bless you all. Love you all. Have an awesome, awesome Hallelujah. week. And we will continue devotions tomorrow morning. Blessings Amen. to all. God bless. Amen.